Hello there. This is Being God's Obedient Sermon Channel. And we have started a new book. We're in Nehemiah. Going to be doing chapters 1 and 2. Uh, pretty quick readings tonight. Little lessons in there. Um, still trying to uh, get my lessons and stuff, uh, teachings, you know, the readings of God's Word and stuff down to, you know, half hour. Try not to do the uh, 45 minutes to one hours. and <laughs> But as the saying goes, sometimes we just got to let the chips lie where they lie. But yeah, so we're going, uh, we, just, just, we just finished up the book of Ezra, which we have to remember this area is not in chronicle, chronological order. And so this is, uh, these books right now are kind of like, they all kind of happen roughly at the same time. So Ezra and Nehemiah is roughly around the same time period. And so we'll go ahead and get started right on into this lesson. Let's get started. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month, um, well, I actually practice to say that name too. Chislu. That's a Chislu, okay. Sometimes when you look at a name, it just wants to mess with you. But I forgot about that one there for a second. <laughs> So, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the twentieth year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And he said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great, and ter uh, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. So I have to take a little break there when it's talking about the great and terrible God. Now, of course, we know God is not terrible. But in this, in this scenario, it is speaking of one to fear. Because that's what God is. The one thing we have to remember about God is we're to love him because he loves us. But also we're to fear his wrath. He is a just God and he must judge justly. That doesn't matter feelings. None of that will be involved. It'll be straight Whatever the word is, whatever the promise is, whatever the judgment is, that's what he will have to do regardless of his feelings. And <clears throat> it's like the same thing. The one other part, you know, of course, I always try to tell people is, you know, one thing I like to tell is uh, explain how parts of the Old Testament and the New Testament, which parts pertain to us today and everything. And here's, you know, the same thing. It says, you know, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Now, in New English, we don't use the word observe as they did in Old Testament times in Old English. Because when you observe something, you you know you watched over it and kept it. 
It's like, you know, it's using the same thing. When you, you, you watched over cooking a meal, you observed what was going on and everything. You paid attention. And part of loving God is keeping his commandments and statutes. This is Old Testament and New Testament. It says this all over. Same thing with following Jesus. But now, God loves all of us. He sent his one and only son to die for our sins. Now, the, the least we can do is love him back, you know. And a lot of people, they don't want to love God. They don't care. And you're going to run, come across those people. Um, I can't remember where it says it in the Bible at, but when you come across people that really you're trying to talk about God and they don't want to hear the word of God, there's a, there's a, there's a, a passage in the Bible where it says, do not cast pearls upon swine. And it's like, don't put jewelry on filthy animals. You know, don't give good things to filthy animals. And that's pretty much what God thinks about people that do not want to learn of him. You know, the creator. The, you know, the Lord and Savior. Now, where to also, if people... It's like Jesus told his disciples when they went out two by two that if you come to a town and no one in the town wants to hear of God's word and the gospel and stuff, then you leave the town and as you leave the town, you knock the dust of that town off your shoes. Don't take any of that town with you. They, will be, they are condemned. It's kind of the same scenario. Our job as Christians, when we witness to people and spread the gospel, we're just there to plant a seed and we let God do everything else after that. They may or may not, you know, grow. It may, you know, they may or may not intrigue even more or, you know, want to learn of God more, go, start going to church or get saved. But that's not, you know, our jobs. Our job is to spread the gospel, share the gospel with all living things. But also we have, to, we have to remember the promises that God keeps us because God does show us mercy and he does keep his promises with us for those that love him and keep his commandments and statutes. But... The one thing is, under New Testament today, an Old Testament is works alone. New Testament is now faith. Faith is the primary thing. You literally can get into heaven with faith only. But in James chapter 2, it says, faith without works is dead. So you can get in with faith only, but God says, do not build rewards on earth, build rewards in heaven. And that's what the works are. When you start, you know, because some things, you, you're, it's, it's a work that you're going to do. The Holy Spirit will not let you not do it. And, you know, that's it. You, you have to live a Christian lifestyle. You have to make a lot of changes in your life and stuff. And those are works by themselves. You know, trying to navigate the world as a Christian, that's a work all on its own. I mean, it's not going to be no, uh, you know, bowing a certain amount of times to a to a statue type thing, or you know, like, you know we're not to do the blood sacrifice sacrifice no more, or, you know, certain ram or certain bullock or certain incense, you know, none of that stuff, none of those works. You know, it's all about maintaining a Christian lifestyle. And trying to you know, share the gospel with all living things. That, that's a work also. But yeah, there's promises God made for those that are his. And so if we have faith 
and God, you know, God comes to us, and we accept Him, and He gifts, and we're gifted the Holy Spirit. You know, there's promises with all that. There's mercy with all that. So, as I said this part of the Bible still stands today, in a sense. Slightly, some little par uh, uh, parts of it have changed a little bit. But you can clearly see here, this is, um, well, you're going to get some more into it. So let's go ahead and just jump on in, uh, continue on here. It's going to start saying what happened. You know, why they were lost the land and they were taken into captivity to King Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon. But anyways, verse 6. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant which I pray before thee now day and night for the children of Israel thy servants and confess the sins of the children of Israel which we have sinned against thee both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments nor the statutes nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. Now, this happens again later on after they crucify Christ. But this is also, you know, that this part was already in place for them to be, you know, taken over by King Nebuchadnezzar. Babylon going to be a world power come in, you know, Artaxerxes. You know, King Artaxerxes and stuff is going to be a world, you know, these areas are going to be a world power at the time. But yeah, I said that, but... <clears throat> This area still stands with today. We're not really promised to be scattered ab abroad, you know, for not keeping commandments and stuff, you know, statutes. But what is promised to us today that, you know, if we're broken, if life's getting to us, you know, getting us down, like we started turning back to the world and it's starting to beat us up again and everything of that nature and our lives are falling apart God says turn from your wicked ways call upon me I will come back to you and heal your lands that's part of our lives as well that still stands today because we can easily fall back to the world you know it's uh I hear like the children of Israel they've witnessed miracles they've seen it with their own eyes and they still fell away I mean most of us have never really witnessed miracles like you know healing parting of the Red Sea you know we don't see stuff like that you know blind to see lame to walk now, I remember Jesus done that in eyes of the Israelites and they still cast him out as well you know human beings are quite uh, I guess cynical we're very untrustworthy I fall in that as well. Life does that to us. Satan wants it to be done that way. That way we don't trust others. That way we don't come in unity. And he's hoping to, you know, keep us, you know, try to split us from God so we get cast into hell. You know, because he doesn't like us at all. He hates us. And he hates God for God loving us. But the one thing true today, just like it was then, is prayer. We are to keep prayers. God wants to hear from us. 
a lot of times we get our prayers answered while we're praying. Happened to me a bunch of times. I know it's not, I'm not I know I'm not the only one. But yeah, the good part is, you know, about us not being under the commandments anymore, under the law. Because the main thing is, no one can keep them. God even knew this for Old Testament. They couldn't keep the laws. They couldn't, you know, they could not maintain it all. But the big problem is, is whenever you don't even try. That's when you really anger God, is whenever you don't even try. Now, we have rules to live by and everything, and God knows we're not going to uphold them all the time. But we are to at least try. It's when we don't, when we know what the rules are, and we say to heck with it, I don't care. That's when we do anger God. And a lot of times God will let us fall into our sins, so that we'll wake up and turn back to Him. Because captivity, hard lives, hard times, troubled, you know hard finances, losing everything in life, all this other stuff. That's a very, very useful tools that, you know, very effective that God uses to get people to realize that they've wronged. You know, they've wronged God or that they need God. Because, you know, we, we can't save ourselves. We can't save each other. Only God can save us from from the hell fire, you know, that's coming if we don't turn to him. But yeah, I've been on the, that little area a little too long. I'm going ahead and just going to jump right on, <laughs> keep on going here. We don't have a lot to read tonight, and I'm sitting there like starting to talk too much about other areas, so I do apologize. But I do know that these things need to be said. People need to know it. I've beat myself up badly about not being able to live as godly as I would like. And that's the beauty and the mercy of God is if you're one of his, blessed with the Holy Spirit, and you mess up and sin, it's automatically forgiven you. No. God knows we can't keep our flesh is so riddled with, you know, sin and full of temptation and everything else. It's so worldly. God knows we can't keep all, you know, his rules. But we are to try. We are to recognize when we do wrong God and apologize for it. But we're not supposed to beat ourselves up up over it too by saying that we own because it's uh, I just heard it today and I love the way it sounded it's uh, I can't remember who it was but they were talking I can't remember who the original author of it was but they were originally talking about how Satan you, discourages you by telling you you're not worthy because you can't keep God's rules And we have, you know, we have to remember that God loved us anyways, knowing that we couldn't. God saved us anyways, knowing we couldn't keep his rules. And, you know, we, we, we you know, we're not going to live a sinless life. We're not going to do it. But God loved us even when we were sinners. He loved us anyways. And as long as we confess to God and give our lives to Him and He blesses us with the Holy Spirit, well, He loves us when we're not perfect because He knows that we can't be. So don't let Satan tell you you're unworthy of God because you mess up. Because you're always going to mess up. I'm always going to mess up. 
And the, the biggest problem is when you got the people that blatantly disregard God's rules and have no intention on keeping God's rules, his, you know, statutes, his commandments. Those are the ones, especially whenever they go to church and claim to be a Christian and stuff and they help mislead people from the church. Or even worse yet, you got these people calling themselves evangelists and Christian, uh, I'm sorry, preachers and all this other stuff and they they don't live godly at all. And they try to use passages like, well, God knows we're not perfect. You're going to love us anyways, blah, blah, blah. And it says, but we are commanded to know a tree by the fruit it bears. Because there's a big difference between somebody that messes up while they're trying to do better and the ones that don't try. And sometimes you got to look in the mirror and figure out which one are you. So, anyways, let's continue on reading verse 9. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper. I pray thee, thy servant, this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. So, of course, right now, this is Nehemiah, and he's the cupbearer of King Artaxerxes. The king of Persia. Let's go to chapter 2. And it came to pass in a month, Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy continent sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid. And said unto the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my continence be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire? Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servants have found favor in thy sight, that thou wouldest send me into Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, For how long shall thy journey be? And when wilt thou return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I set him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, If it please the king, let letters be given me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come into Judah. And a letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertained to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sanballat the uh, Horonite and Tobiah the servant of uh, the, the servant the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek welfare of the children of Israel. So just like then, just like today, there's people all over the world, they hate 
the Israelites. They just hate them. They hate God. They hate the Israelites. Because, you know, why? why well, it's like you can understand that they're jealousy because this is God's chosen people. And they're like, you know, they're sitting there. <laughs> I'm a little jealous of them too. I get a little upset. It's like, you know, you've been given everything from God. You were just born an Israelite and all of a sudden you've been blessed with land and all this other stuff. And, you know, easily have a great life if you just do what you're told by God. And, and it's like they, a lot of times, mock God. They just, you know, blatantly. And it's like, you know, <laughs> what's not to be jealous about? <laughs> but, yeah, it's mostly what it is. Well, it seems like anyways, but. You know, it's just, can you imagine how people are so wicked around that they hate God that much that they just want to punish God's people? You know, as Jesus said, it's not you, it's not you they hate, it's me that it lives in you that they hate. And it's true, so it's something about, you know, talking about God and Jesus a lot of people, they just, they literally would like to just kill you over it. This is why we're not to witness alone. So I always remember that. You don't go out witnessing alone. You know, you're always, you know, always have, supposed to have people with you. Because even Jesus told his disciples, you know, in the coming days, if you, when he is, you know, Jesus said when he is gone in the coming days, if you have two coats, sell one and get a sword. See, when Jesus knows that we're going to have to protect ourselves, that people are going to try to harm us. But continue on, verse 11. So I came to Jerusalem and there, and was there three days. And I arose in the night, I and some, and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me save the beast that I rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, and to the dung port, and viewed the walls of Jerusalem which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up in the night by the brook and viewed the wall, and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not whither I went or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews nor to the priest nor to the nobles, nor to the rulers, nor to the rest that did the work. Then said I unto them, I see the distress that we are in, now how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Come, and let us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. Then I told them of the hand of my God, which was good upon me, as also the king's word that he had spoken unto me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for this good work. But when Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the servant of uh, the servant the Ammonite and Geshem the Arabian heard it, they laughed us to scorn. And despised us and said, What is this thing that ye do? Will ye rebel against the king? Then answered I them and said unto them, The God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore we his servants will arise and build, but ye have no portion nor right nor memorial in Jerusalem. And that's the end of, a les end of this lesson here. But yeah, pay attention to that little section right there. We as Christians are the same thing as the Israelites in a sense. We are God's people. 
when we have faith in God and God comes to us, he has chosen us. And then we accept his gift. We are gifted with the Holy Spirit. We are saved. And all we have to do is have faith to be saved. But then you have these other people that are non-believers. You know, just like the rest of the world, these Ammonites, the Arabian, the, Hor the Horonite, you know, these, you know, these people are non-believers in the area. We're living around, well, we have non-believers living around us all the time. Constantly mocking us, making fun of us for following God and believing in heaven and stuff because they so badly hope it's not real because they don't want to go to hell. You know, I guess they, I guess they think that if they ignore it long enough, or whatever, then it won't, you know, it won't happen to them. They won't be punished by it or whatever. But we have that part, it's like, you know, um, we will prosper, we will arise. When Jesus returns, we will arise. We will meet him in the air. The rapture it speaks of. More details of this, you know, it's, uh, I think it's in the, talks about this in the book of Daniel. In Revelation, it doesn't speak of the, you know, the meeting in the air part and everything. I think that's in, that's in the, when it's talking about the, the story of Daniel in that time frame. Um, we're going to be coming up to that. We're not at it yet, of course. <laughs> we're in Nehemiah. But we will arise up. We're to build rewards in heaven, not on earth. And the non-believers, they have no portion in what God's going to give to us. They have no portion of it. Now, we all have a right to it if we believe, have faith in God. And desire him we all have a right to it it's free for all but those who do not accept will have no portion or memorial and instead of in Jerusalem just put in heaven in God's presence you know A lot of these people in this time, they didn't get that. Because uh, any of them, they wouldn't have been an Israelite, but they could have converted to Judaism. You know, even though they weren't born an Israelite, they could still you know, get into heaven as well. be a part of, you know, God's grace and everything. But they did have to convert to Judaism. Now, it's free for everybody. You don't have to convert to Judaism or anything of that nature. And that's the that's the good part about being under grace today. So much better than being under the law. But yep, as I said, that's the end of this lesson. And I'm already over a little, over 30 minutes, sorry. So I'm going to go ahead and end this, you know, this reading here. So once again, we've got to remember to pray. I know it's the middle of the week. I'm a little off. I've been doing some tasks and some stuff around the house. I was supposed to have done this yesterday or last night, and I got sidetracked, lost track of time. You know, just too late to get started. I always have to wait till close to, you know, later in the night time to do these things. That way my dogs are making, not making as much noise. 
I got a dog that barks at everything. So when there's less traffic out there and everything, he's not barking. And, but yeah, so. <laughs> life just is what life is. We all, we all have it. We all got stuff to do. God knows it. We all know it. That's why I kind of kept this a little short. There's only, I think there's 13 chapters in Nehemiah. And so there's going to be more verses on the next lesson. I think it's going to be 50, 60 something verses total. I think 30 something. I think there's going to be, I think chapters three and four are each 30 something verses somewhere in there. But a lot of times it doesn't matter. You know, sometimes we got short verses, we got long verses. But, but yeah, remember to pray. Um, you know, the world is, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now. A lot of crazy stuff going on. Possibly looking at another World War Three. Uh, I mean, another World War Another world war, but this being three. You know, I'm a disabled veteran. You know, I'm not not liking the idea of that. I do believe that there will be an invasion of America if that happens. America's not ready for it. We don't have a military that's worth a hill of beans. It's mostly filled with people that love communism. They're not, they don't care about the Constitution. Our current governments did everything they could to kick out all the good soldiers we had that believed in the Constitution in America. And now they're going to try to fill it up. Seems like they're, seems like they're going to try to fill it up with people that are just, you know, they would gladly shoot American citizens. So they're probably not even going to be from America with all the illegal immigrants that's come across the border. Now they're talking about putting them in the military to give them a chance at citizenship. And it's like right now, our ranks are depleted. And so they're going to fill up the military with a bunch of people that either that they're diversity hires that hate America, hate freedom, hate the Constitution, hate capitalism. And they were even born in America. Or they're going to fill it up with people that just, they have no loyalty to nothing. Just whoever pays them the most and gives them whatever they want. It'd be a hard thing if we get invaded by China, Russia, and our own military all at the same time. A lot of Americans don't have a clue what that would look like. But yeah, anyways, we, we need to pray about that. Pray that we might be able to get good politicians in office that's going to stop this from going on and happening. It's, uh, but yeah, we're not having an election until November. Even then, not till, you know, January of 2025 will any new politicians take office. There's a lot of damage that can be done in a few months. It can take decades to just, you know, try to undo the damage that's happened. So, yeah, we really need to pray here in America. But we've got to pray for the whole world because crazy stuff's happening everywhere. It's like, uh, you know, Ireland, what what they do, they uh, they destroyed most of all their livestock because they was worried about methane, you know, cow farts. I'm like, that's your food. They're like, and you're just going to destroy it all because you're, you know, someone told you to worry about cow farts? We got a lot of idiots out there today, and they're in powerful positions that are going to do a lot of damage and a lot of harm to innocent people. And I'm, and I, you know, I'm part Irish, and it's like, that, that's, that's, I'm ashamed of that right now because I've always thought about, you know, if I had the money, 
I'm Scott Irish, actually. I love to go and live in either one of the homelands from you know, you know from my uh, from my heritage. I've been in Europe. I was stationed in Germany and stuff like that. And I love the weather there and everything. I lived for five years in Europe. And, but I mean, if this is a crazy garbage that they're going to do because they're listening to a bunch of idiots instead of common sense. And then you think as well, somebody elected these idiots in the office. It's like, you know, what, what, what's going on with the citizens today that they would actually elect something like this in the office. Uh, it's just uh, the whole world needs some help we need lots of prayer <laughs> so with that in mind as I said I'm going to end this lesson here so until next time God bless good night and goodbye